Hello everyone, today is Thursday, August 29, 2019, and this is the week in charts. I obviously want to thank all you guys and girls for attending today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as I often sum it up, stealing a line from my buddy Greg Morris. A lot of stuff can happen between now and then. We were watching a presentation of someone years ago, and Greg leaned over to me and said, you know, a lot of it can happen between now and then. I guess somebody was showing a system and didn't quite see what could happen, but uh, I digress a little bit. And I don't want to get anybody in trouble or pick on anybody because God knows you can pick my stuff apart too. All right, what are we talking about? Well, obviously current market conditions. I've kind of beat the dead horse on everything I need to say here, so I thought it'd be good to get back and just maybe some classic Dave Landry. And I found an older presentation that I repurposed and refurbished for today. And that's what's part of what took me a while to get uh, up and running today. So we'll get to that in just one second. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, keep them relative to the slides. And that's to keep my ADD from kicking in. And then when we get to the live charts, as soon as I start talking about the markets using live charts, feel free to punch in any stock picks you might want. and for your benefit, if you don't mind, just ask about one stock at a time. That way I know if I covered it or not. All right, so what are we talk about? Well, again, let's I'm gonna go take a step back and go to a classic Dave Landry. This is something that I published several years ago and have republished several times since. And then I want to take a brief look at the TFM 10% system before we hop into the markets. And if you want to know a lot more about that, I've got a plethora of videos, especially recently on YouTube on that, plus some other simplified market time. And I'll touch upon some of that in the live charts. All right. So be warned to those of you who know me, and looks like from what I can see, it's everybody that's here today, there's some dead horse beating just ahead. Years ago, I asked my wife to take a look at a column, and she did. And, she, and I said, well, what do you think? And I was pretty excited about it. And she said, well, you say a lot of the same shit. And I'm like, yeah. And, and then I was a little beat up when she said that. And then I got to think about it. It's like, well, I'm going to keep saying the same shit until you people get it. Not you people here, but just people in, in general. You'd be surprised at how many people just don't listen. And I've had people, as I've said before, email me. One guy, it's probably 20 years now, and finally cut him off. Poor, poor guy. But it's probably the best thing I could have done for him. You know, let him just quit trading or go find someone else. But he didn't listen. He never listened to what I said. And part of that motivated me to do the learning management system. But I digress. And we'll take a look at that learning management system towards the end of the presentation. So, again, this is going to be some classic Dave Landry. 17 Secrets to Trading. Now, the number one secret to trading is there is no secret to trading. All of these gurus really get under my skin because they claim it's so easy and they have the secret, but, but they don't. And one thing good is that the Internet out there, or there's the Internet out there, I should say, and you could do a little research on these guys, and if if you're willing to dig a little, you could find out some really bad things about how disingenuous they are. So I would encourage you to do that. Now, the question is repeatability. In some cases, and I almost want to just say allegedly because it, it's it's still somewhat doubtful, but some of these people have done some incredible things. Now, not to take that away from them, but in some cases, they could have been in the right place at the right time. If I'd have quit trading at the end of 1999 and told you how great I was, you would have been blown out of the water, okay? And some of these people are still riding on those coattails from many, many, many years ago. So even if they did do what they said they did, could you rinse and repeat could you do the exact same thing and they make it sound like you can but i think the more important
question to ask is, can they rinse and repeat? And if, and that's a big if, if what they're saying is true, could they rinse and repeat? And there's one thing recently that somebody pointed out to me when I was kind of like, wow, I can't believe that they would go out and say this, but they they claim to parlay this small sum into some ridiculous sum of money. And then that if you give them, I think it was several thousand dollars, they were going to do it again. Well, if I could parlay 2000 into 2 million or whatever it was, and I felt confident that I could do it over and over, I would just do 2000 into 2 million again and again and again and again. And as I said before, someone else out there, and I'm, I'm, I'm almost stopped short of saying who exactly he is, but you could figure it out. Anyway, he claimed that you could take 5K and turn it into 500K and that it was pretty easy. And when you get to 100K, he said, go ahead, just go ahead and quit your day job and go from there. I was up close and personal with a good friend of mine, and his claim to fame was he took about $5,000 of somewhat questionable origin, which I would later find out. I didn't know at the time. And he ran it into roughly a million dollars. I saw a statement, and I can't remember the exact numbers. It was either 954,000 sticks in my head or 979,000. But it was close enough for government work to a million dollars. Unfortunately, he round-tripped it. And I remember when he was approaching a million, I suggested that, even though it's a it's a bad investment from an investment standpoint, but... I suggested that if he was that good, take that million dollars and put it in some kind of annuity that would lock him up for life. And at the time, interest rates were a little bit better. So I was guessing maybe 5% or so, or whatever, about 50 grand a year. And back then, 50 grand was still 50 grand, as uh, using a yogiism. And in that particular case, he could have lived on that money for the rest of his life. And if he was that good, he could have rinsed and repeated. And that was my point, is just take a small sum of that, put the rest of it in an annuity. You've got a guaranteed income for life. Now, you might not be living high on the hog, but back then that was enough money to live on. It was plenty. I mean, it's never enough, but you know what I'm saying. And he says, I'm not going to take financial advice from you. Well, he ended up round-tripping the account, and he ended up homeless and actually on my couch for a while until I was lucky enough to meet my bride, Marcy, and she got him kicked out of the house really quick. <laughs> anyway, so could they rinse and repeat? And to that I say, doubt it. <laughs> I don't know if you guys remember this for a while back. The video went viral about someone who just got their wisdom teeth out, and they were a little loopy. But I seriously doubt that these people with these big claims to fame could rinse and repeat. So don't beat yourself up. And, and, I, and one reason, truth be told, that these guys aggravate the shit out of me is because I wonder, do, do they really have the holy ground? What the hell are they doing? And I realize it's just a big waste of time whenever I dig a little further. But just remember, as I preach, here it comes. No one knows exactly what a market will do. Not you, not me, and certainly not the guy who screams on TV. I would make a lot more money in my educational business if I told you that I had the secret. And if you just give me a bunch of money, I'd give it to you. <laughs> the reality is, reality doesn't sell. So I've got to figure out how to sell reality to make the educational business work. My reward, more than monetary, though, is when I strike a chord with you guys and girls and I see you do really well. And as I've said before, a few of you have taken my stuff and done exceptionally well. It's kind of like stealing my bike off my porch as a kid and then riding around. And when you get back around the front of my house, you pop a wheelie. But I'm proud of you. Now... 
the number two secret is you don't have to be a brainiac. Average intelligence is enough. How do you think I became a trend following moron? I did have a few stints in my career where I tried to outsmart the market, and I still occasionally try to outsmart the market because I'm Dave Landry. You know, I get a little drink a little bit too much of my own Kool-Aid. But for the most part, I've learned to embrace the title of trend following more. And I was very offended when I was first called that because it was from someone allegedly, I'm not sure, I don't know for a fact it was an anonymous email, but I'm 99.9% I'm .9 sure who, who did it. But it was someone I had a tremendous amount of respect for, but they began fighting market trends and losing a lot of money. And I was just drawing big blue arrows in the late 90s and following along. And their arguments against me were very convincing. And I questioned myself, but then I realized that whenever I tried to outsmart the market, I lost money, and whenever I just followed along like a dumb little trend-following moron, I made money. Not all the time, but over time. And then that seems to have struck a chord with quite a few of you, and you send me emails saying, fellow TFM here, and that just warms my heart. Kind of like Gaga's Little Monsters and Slipknot's Maggots, I've got my TFMs. William Eckert, I think, said it the best. I haven't seen much correlation between good trading and intelligence. Many outstandingly intelligent people are horrible traders. Average intelligence is enough. Beyond that, emotional makeup is more important. I sometimes bump into the man on the street and we strike up a conversation and they find out what I do and they try to tell me about how they bottom fish and all this other stuff, and I try to explain to them how the market works. They start talking about news and this and that, and I try to explain to them, and they just don't want to hear that it's just an uptrend, a downtrend, or sideways. Why, I do not know. Number three, attitude is more important than aptitude. Now, this is the biggie. If you've been following along for the last 20-something years, you know that this is definitely a reoccurring theme. I would much rather have someone with a good attitude than someone who's really smart, because someone who's really smart is going to be a lot harder to train as opposed to someone who's, who accepts what is, is. And I see a lot of people, as soon as something kind of works like they thought it should, whether it's conceptually correct or not, whether they got lucky or not, they immediately strike it up to their supreme intelligence as opposed to thanking the market gods and doing a serious post-mortem to determine whether or not they truly do have something or just got lucky. By the way, and that's Annie Duke's book, Thinking of Vets, which it was, it's a fantastic book. I wish she did have the answer that she proposes is figuring out how to separate luck from skill. And she gave you a few ideas towards the end. But if you could figure out how to separate luck from skill, I think that you would own the world or certainly do quite well. And the secret there, I think, is being process oriented and following the process deliberate practice, always working to get better, and then, of course, throwing in a post-mortem at the end of everything. Did you truly get lucky in the trade? Did you follow your system? Was it the best of the best, as I'm going to harp, harp on in a few seconds, imagine that, or did you just get lucky? Now, as I preach, a market can only do three things. It can go up, it can go down, or it could just go sideways. Why is it going up? I do not know. Why is it going down? I do not know. Actually, I do. It's going up because there's demand. It's going down because there's supply. The market's attitude is bullish. The market's attitude is bearish. And sometimes when supply equals demand, the market's attitude is it doesn't know. It doesn't know how it feels. And we'll look at the live charts in just one second. Now, I know the up, down, and sideways thing is Captain Obvious. But 
you'd be surprised at how many, especially smart people, fight the market. How many people send me charts and say, I'm going to buy this stock. It's like, looks like the big blue arrow is pointing down. One fun thing or advantage, however you want to look at it, fun for me at least, I've been blessed with being able to travel the world. And one thing I found is human nature is human nature. In Hong Kong, years ago, my the guy that was assigned to me to be my handler was a very good trader, was a very smart guy, probably too smart. And the Hang Sing, if memory serves, was down about 20% for the year. And it had dropped hard for several months in a row, so it was down really hard. And he, too, even though he claimed to be a trader, was down 20% like the overall market. And he began to reason with me that it's too low to sell. So that sunk cost fallacy and all these other behavioral finance and trading psychology terms rears its ugly head. Human nature is human nature. But it amazes me how many people will fight the market in spite of up, down, or sideways. This is the back of my business card, and I've taken steps in more recent times to do something a little bit more permanent on that. I have the instructions written on my right arm. I tried to explain to somebody in a gym yesterday, pointing to the instructions, and they were very confused and wanted to talk about trade wars and other things. And I'm like, okay, that's not how it works. That's not how any of this works. Speaking of which, news is noise. If you have gone through the Trading Full Circle course, I took a page out of Greg Morris's book and showed a chart where there was a plethora of news events. And like Greg does, I challenge the viewers to figure out where those events were. And in Greg's case, he had used a long-term stock chart and showed all these different earning periods and stuff. And first of all, he said, can you pick out where the earning periods were? And then can you pick out whether it was a positive or a negative earning and go from there? So news is noise, but Dave, doesn't news affect the markets? Yes, but you, you don't know how it's going to affect the market. So you're going to have to ignore all news. Now, there may be cases where if you're doing super short-term trading and not trying to get on a trend trade like we generally do, especially with the core methodology, there might be cases where if you're thinking about taking a, a, a short-term Forex trade, you might want to make sure it's not a Fed meeting or something like that. And I, I almost didn't just say that because I don't want to confuse you and make you think I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth. If you're following a longer term, a short to intermediate term, I should say, methodology like mine, where you're looking for a swing trade and you're willing to hold on a long, long time, then news is noise. If you're trying to day trade something or purely swing trade something, then you might have to avoid those news days. But for the most part, or I should say, as far as I'm concerned, in my core trading, meaning the pullbacks, the bow ties, the first thrust, and things of that nature, as uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger used to say, I am completely ignoring the news. And I could say that a thousand times, and I'll still get emails asking me, what about Brexit? What about this? What about that? <laughs> One time, I didn't even know who the Fed chairman was, and uh, my wife said, stop telling people that. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, well, I, I didn't. You know, I didn't. I had no idea. I didn't pay any attention to the news. I haven't had a TV in my office in years. I did have one a while back for a while. In the new office, I'll have one, but I'm going to probably use it mostly as a computer monitor, and I'm not going to put on the business channel. That I can promise you. Now, every methodology has its nuances. You're not just going to print money with a methodology. The aforementioned guru, and I sat through his painstakingly painful video <laughs> about a week or so ago, he said that every trade he recommends, assuming you have just $1,000 in your account, is worth $500. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, no, you don't, Danny. It's like, no, it, it doesn't work like that. And if it did, why would you tell anyone? 
So with my stuff, it does have its nuances. The pure trend following has abysmal drawdowns and really poor accuracy. You're going to be wrong. I forget the exact numbers. I think it's like 72 and 18 percent. But you're going to be wrong, let's say, at least three quarters of the time with a longer term trend follower. You're going to be a little bit more accurate with swing trading. Somebody just emailed me a few days ago, wanted to know exactly what that figure was. I don't know exactly what that figure is. But let's just say on a swing trade, you're a little closer to 50-50, and hopefully you can improve upon those odds a little bit. But the bottom line is there's going to be drawdowns. There's going to be extended flat times where the market just doesn't do anything and chops around, chops around. And obviously most sectors and most stocks do the same thing. And you're going to be bored to tears. Most people during the bored to tears phase or the drawdown phase give up right before they reap the fruits of their labor. And sometimes they go off the chase rainbows and come back 10 years later and say, okay, Dave, I get it. Up, down, and sideways. I know. I had the privilege of being on a, a short-lived but very interesting project. This thing had the potential to be huge, or as Donald Trump would say, huge. <laughs> and we were on a team that read like a who's who of the trading world and investment world. We had a hedge fund manager, uh, Greg Morris, who was running, I think, five big in its time, was part of the team. Little O Me was part of the team, Larry McMillan, and quite a few others. And I don't want to try to name everyone because I'm sure I'll leave somebody out. But the point was I, was, I was very humbled to be on this team. And some of the guys were much more active than me. The option people certainly had a lot more to provide than I do as far as frequency of trades. And I felt like I might not be worthy for this project because I might go days, weeks, or even longer without having anything to submit. And the only way we got paid was to submit a trade. This was a newsletter that cost $40,000 a year. And I really can't get into the details, but we felt, especially during the wild enthusiasm phase of project, <laughs> If you, any of you guys have been on projects, you'll probably know. But during a wild enthusiasm phase, we felt like we could probably have, I don't want to exaggerate, but we maybe 100 subscribers would be possible. I know, it was, it was ridiculous. And we figured that it was going to be a shoe in In fact, at first sale, basically the guy cut us off and said, just sign me up and leave me alone. And that's what we thought we would, we would have. Anyway, I don't want to go into too many details. But I called Peter up and said, Peter, look, I don't know if I'm the guy you want for this project because I might go days, weeks, or God forbid, even months without a trade to submit. And he said, Dave, and he cut me off a little bit and said, look, you're exactly the guy we want. Don't invent trades. And I think that's a wonderful saying. And I love that phrase. And that's why I beat the dead horse on that so much. Do nothing while there's nothing to do. Now, the big problem is trading can be exciting. I will tell you this, though. Trading done properly is often quite boring. But if you're looking for excitement, as I often preach, go to Vegas or have an affair. That way you only lose half of your money. Now, the number eight secret to trading is that you just need one in only one simple methodology. Linda Raski once said, all you need is one pattern to be successful. Years ago, another classic Big Dave story, but years ago, I used to program systems morning, noon, and night. And I would come in after work and brag to my bride, Marcy, about my greatest and latest system and its accuracy and its drawdowns and that spout off some statistics. And usually she would suffer a fool gladly. But one night she kind of looked at me, cocked her head a little bit to one side and said, how many systems do you really need? How many trading systems do you really need? 
And I was a little taken back by that because I was pretty excited about my latest and greatest discovery. But that was pretty much the end of my grail hunting. And it was an epiphany for me. And you just need one system, just one. And that has to be the one that's conceptually correct, the one that makes sense to you, and above all, the one that you can follow consistently. I know, easier said than done. But if you can't trade one system, what makes you think you could trade a dozen? Like in City Slickers, when, what's his name? Bill, can't think of his name. I can see his face. Anyway, he asks Curly the secret to life, and Curly holds up his finger. And he's like, your finger? He's like, no, one thing. It's like, just do one thing and do it well. And that's why the city slickers would get all stressed out as they just tried to do all everything and couldn't find just that one thing to do. So in trading, like Curly said, find that one thing. So do one thing and do it well. My work is done. Peace out. Dropping a mic as I walk off the stage. Those are expensive mics. I got to quit doing that. Now, how many times have you heard this? You must plan the trade and trade the plan. I know, but if you could do that, you've proven that what you've had what it takes to be a trader. The rest is just tweaking what you do. So if you could plan out a trade, even if it's a crappy trade, it turns out to be a crappy trade, and you do a post-mortem and figure it out, yeah, that was a crappy trade, probably shouldn't have done that. I need to get a little bit better in that. Again, work hard to separate that luck from skill. But if you prove you can do it by doing it, then you will become successful. And that's the hard part, actually following the plan. Micromanagement is probably the biggest sin that I see out there. Again, people try to outsmart the markets. People take profits too soon. They exit at the first signs of adversity. And the reality is, more often than not, the market will be going against you as we'll soon see. Kind of reminds me of the Marcellus Wallace speech from Pulp Fiction. And kind of along the lines, because it's a boxing analogy, the Mike Tyson or Mike Tyson's manager or whatever said, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. So you have to go in and follow that plan. And I'm going to give you a couple little things, simple things to help you do that. But the bottom line is, it's like the day of the trade. You're going to feel pride effing with you f pride okay you have to overcome that now speaking of pride and other emotions you cannot separate emotions from trading as i've said before and i learned this first from denise shawl several years ago when i was speaking in san francisco at the tsaa annual conference and i'm gonna say it again in a few weeks when i return to san francisco to speak once again you can't make any decision, even what you're going to have for lunch, without emotions and stress. As I've said before, there's days where, especially after these shows, I crave fried food. I don't know why. I guess the just the hurry, 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 do the show, do the show. I feel like I want a reward, and it's like I want to rush out and get a bucket of fried chicken or some greasy <laughs> catfish. You gotta. It takes a lot of greasy stuff to maintain the big day body. I'm working on that, though. I really am. I know I've been <laughs> go back a little old presentations. I'm working on it, but no, I really am working on that. But anyway, long story endless, even a lunch decision has stress. I could stay home and eat a salad and a chicken breast or a piece of fish, or I could run out and, and get something greasy. If I run out and get something greasy, then I'm going to have to work it off. Then I'm going to be tired all afternoon, and it's like all this, I, I can't think of a better way of saying it, but I go through all this mental masturbation. So every decision has emotions and stress. And again, as I learned from Damasio and, and originally from Shaw and then some follow-up research with Damasio and others, people who have had illness or injury that destroys that little emotional part of their brain, they can't make any decisions, not even what they're going to have for lunch because no decision has a consequence. No decision has emotion. No decision has stress involved with it. And as I've said quite often, when you start violating that plan, the amount of decisions grows geometrically. It's kind of like a binary tree. So you didn't take this decision that you already had planned out, 
So now you're left with two more decisions and maybe three or more. Let's say your stock triggers that you did some careful analysis on or you borrowed my analysis from my trading service and you thought to yourself, self, that looks like a really good trade. Where does Dave say get in? 10, where's he gonna stop? Eight, where's he gonna, where does he have his initial profit target? 12, I need to work on my grammar today. <laughs> But anyway, you're convinced that it does look good and you're ready to go in and it triggers, but then it comes right back in. And now you're like, well, wait a minute. Do I get in now that it's trading at 975? That would be a bargain based on the entry price. Or maybe I'll just wait and see if it continues to drop and it continues to drop. And that's like, well, now do I get in that it's even more of a bargain? And then it begins to rally a little bit. And he's like, well, hang on. Let me just see if it comes back in. And then it rallies some more and rallies some more. And so now every observation you're making, you're making, you're adding a decision and another decision and another decision. And indecision is also a decision. You've decided not to decide as the members of the aging rock band Rush on their 401k tour once sang. And I guess they're still seeing it now. So what's the secret to controlling your emotions? Well, I'm sure that's a little bit more than I'm going to present here, but I'm going to show you something that makes a hell of a lot of sense. First of all, you have to know your neurology. And we have the upper brain, if you want to look at, look, look at it like that, the neocortex, I think it's the actual term for it. And then we have the lower brain, the part of the which is the limbic system and I guess the hippocampus and all the other stuff down there, the stuff that keeps you alive and functioning on a day-by-day -day basis. The higher level is the upper brain. The lower level is the autonomous systems, your emotions, your fear, sadness, etc. And a lot of that comes from the amygdala. It's very fast acting, as I've said before, in caveman times, you had to think about the flight or fight when that saber-toothed tiger was getting ready to eat you. In more modern-day times, you go to step off a curb and a cab driver's coming at you. As Elf said, the yellow ones don't stop. Be careful. <laughs> you have to make that snap decision. There's not time to think about it. I was on a bike a couple of months back, and I was zooming, zooming for me at least, doing about I don't know, probably 15, 14 or 15 on a mountain bike. That's that's pretty fast. Give me a break. And I had, even though I had the right of way, there I heard a loud noise. It was a truck pulling a trailer, and it was probably doing 45 miles an hour on like a little country road, a little 20 mile an hour street or whatever. And so I immediately jammed on my brakes. If I'd have spent any time contemplating my navel. I would have gotten run over. So without emotions and this lower level brain, you'd probably be dead in a day, maybe even less than that. Well, obviously the autonomous systems would go up pretty quick, but the point I'm trying to make is without that emotional point part, you'd be dead in a day. You wouldn't be a functioning human being. And that's why people who have had that damage have to be in the institutions, or have to be in institutions, I should say. So you want to embrace your amygdala. Now, this is a really simple thing to do. The next time you find yourself getting ready to have an emotional reaction to your spouse or significant other, don't. Just count to three, and you're welcome. As I've said before, I told my wife Marcy about this because she's like, what are you talking about? So I'm going to talk a little bit about neurology. She's like, neurology? Doesn't sound like something a trend following moron would talk about. Well, it's important. And she goes, well, give me an example. And I gave her the example of count to three. She's like, you do that? I'm like, you have no idea how much I do that, baby. <laughs> but maybe I need to learn how to do that a little bit more. But what happens is when you take that small pause, you are allowing a chance to use the rest of what's sloshing around up there. On every order that I click in, I count to three. And as I've said before, I do have a little clock. Sometimes I'll wind a clock. Take my hands off the keyboard, wind a clock. Let's see where my clock is. I've got to find it now. I've got everything buried in this little office. Hopefully I'll be out here in a few few weeks. But anyway, long story endless, wind a clock goes back to what Greg Morris wrote about in investing in the trend, investing with the trend, 
when he was first in fire pilot school, and by the way, he became top gun after a few years, pilot, so he, he made it through, obviously. But when he was first in the simulator, he got kicked out of the simulator quite a bit, as most pilots do, because they sound off a bunch of alarms and create all these situations to try to freak the pilot out, and almost all pilots freak out. And Greg decided that if he was going to stay in flight school, he was going to have to figure a workaround for that. So back then, I guess this was an F-4 simulator, I'm guessing, they had an analog clock that had to be wound every so often. I think it's what they call a seven-day clock or something, but anyway. So he would, when the alarm started going off, he'd wind the clock. That would be the first instinctive action he did that trained him to take that deep breath, to bypass the amygdala, and use the rest of what's sloshing around up there. He later told me stories about winding the clock, and it was more of a, it was a figuratively, I guess you'd say, wind the clock because clocks became digital over time. But in, in his airline pilot career, they lost an engine once. And he said he has a lot of other stories that he doesn't. He doesn't openly share, but if you if you noodle him enough, he'll tell you a story or two. But since this was related to what we we're talking about and circled back to trading, he said that they once lost an engine, and then he did his little wind o'clock thing, which I guess has touched the dash in more recent times. The co-pilot immediately said, let's shut it off. And Greg touched the dash, took a deep breath, and said, no, 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 let's leave it on. And if it doesn't flame out and do whatever, cause damage, then we'll we'll shut it off then, but let's just see what happens, leave it on. And he explained to the co-pilot that these fighter pilots are <laughs> have ice in their veins. He explained to the co-pilot that if you just shut the engine off, you risk the chance of shutting down the wrong engine and you don't know if you're going to get it restored or not. And this would have been a really big deal because they were on final approach when this happened. And he was able to land a plane with one engine and no one aboard knew what happened. Had nobody, no one was to the wiser. So I know it sounds kind of simple, but just waiting a few seconds will keep you out of that bad trade. And I'm an emotional guy, okay? As I often say, I, I cry like a schoolgirl if I'm forced to watch a Nicholas Sparks movie or if my wife, you guys are married, don't laugh at me. You're going to have to do some of these things. You suck it up. It comes with territory. But you're going to have to watch some girly movies. And I am somewhat emotional. And it's somewhat shocking how many times I've caught myself from making an emotional decision just by counting to three before I click in. And that has been a godsend for me. So if you don't walk away with anything today, just do that. But Dave, you say that all the time. Yeah, but do you take a pause before you actually click in? Number 11, boy, this is the beat the dead horse to death, huh? Beat the dead horse to death. <laughs> beat the dead horse even more. I often ask, how come you can't how come you can't talk about a dead cat bounce, but you can talk about beating a dead horse? Well, evidently nowadays you can't even talk about beating a dead horse. Well, I'm gonna keep saying dead cat bounce and beat the dead horse. I don't care. Somebody said smash the potato. Well, I'm sure sometimes someday they'll find out that potatoes have feelings. But anyway, as I often say, market could be a really bad teacher. I see it over and over and over again. I'll see something happen in the markets. And people will put up a post, I told you. It's like, oh, geez. The market has just taught them that what they thought was correct, but it's not always true. And that's the thing. You can have fantastic analysis and still be wrong on market direction. You could have really crappy analysis and be right, and sometimes be right quite often. And that market will lull you into a false sense of security. Now, as I've been saying lately, you really have to resist the urge to join the church of what's happening now. Now, 
you'll see that I do trade where the action is. And I'm going to flesh this out in a little bit more detail in a few seconds here. What I'm referring to about joining the church of what, what's happening now is system surfing. And I see a lot of people do this. As soon as something stops working, they go off to try something else. And more often than not, they end up perpetually out of phase. So find something simple and stick with it. Now, as far as I'm concerned, as I said last week and prior to last week, if you're just seeing me, and for one example, I think it was 2015 when the market was rolling over and I was short a bunch of banks and other stodgy stocks, I pulled the portfolio up. You're thinking like, this guy just shorts a bunch, shorts a bunch of banks and other stodgy stocks. In more recent times, we've been having quite a few opening gap reversals. This is especially true with all this news flowing into the system. But Dave, I thought you don't trade news. No, I don't. But if it creates a technical pattern that's worth trading, such as an opening gap reversal, especially in a strong uptrend, then it's worth a shot. And sometimes, especially after energies have bottomed out for a long, long time, one of my favorite patterns there is the Phoenix strategy. That doesn't come along very often, maybe once every five years or even longer when these energy stocks just bottom out and look abysmal and you never think that energies will ever come back and they begin to rise from the ashes. So people see me do that. I'm like, well, this guy just trades a bunch of energy stocks coming up all time lows. A lot of times, more often than not, I trade pullbacks in small cap tech stocks. So people see me do that and think that's all I do. And then in some of the more recent times, you'll see me trade some breakouts in IPOs and think, well, this guy just trades a bunch of IPOs. And I see people actually post some things on the Internet like, oh, he just trades a bunch of IPOs. Like, well, that's true. But if the IPOs aren't trending and I'm able to find some other opportunities elsewhere, I'm going to take those opportunities. And. You might think this guy just trades a bunch of small cap gold stocks. Well, I'm going to show you a large cap gold stock we're in, but I do have another small cap gold stock in my portfolio now. And a lot of people think I don't do shit <laughs> because I might go weeks and sometimes months without discussing a new opportunity. So right now, I've been trading quite a few opening gap reversals. I've been trading some breakouts in brand new IPOs. And I've been trading some gold stocks. And the question mark is, shorts a bunch of banks and stodgy, other stodgy stocks, such as big cap retail. And that's a question mark because I might be looking to do that now. And I also, in more recent times, haven't recommended a lot of stocks in the trading service. So you're wondering if I ever do anything. So the church of what's happening now is within your methodology with possibly a few things that might be on the fringe of the methodology. So for me, it's it's mostly 99% trend following with the occasional opening gap reversal in the overall market or in bonds or something like that. That's contra trend, but that's just a day trade. And that's the minority of what I'm doing. But for the most part, the church of what's happening now is okay within your own methodology that just means that you're trading with the act, where the action is. But don't go out and chase new methodologies. Stick with what you're doing. Stick with the plan. Regarding old classics, I recently acquired Toby Crable's old classic day trading with short-term patterns and opening range breakouts. Great price on eBay. Would you mind sharing what you got it for? Because I know it's not a um, it's not a cheap book. I have a history of accumulating these old classic Wall Street texts, not knowing they're classics, I just buy them and then uh, later find out. 197, wow, that's a good price. That's a damn good price. I'll give you 250. <laughs> so again, when it comes to the church and what's happening now, trade what's hot and be patient with what's not within your methodology. Don't system surf. Don't chase gurus, especially if it sounds too good to be true. That's the bottom line. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Number 12, 
you're going to be wrong a lot. And this one's hard for me. As I've said quite a bit, I took a personality test. Larry Williamson wrote a book. It's pretty good on training psychology. I think he's a medical doctor. And one of the things they suggested doing was take a personality test. And I found out found out I had like a 0%. It, it might have been like 20%, but it was low. And there was a few of the, the things within the few of the sub areas. I was even at least 0%. <laughs> In agreeableness. So it's like I found out that I'm not a very agreeable guy. Well, I thought I was the most agreeable guy in the world. And I guess that's as long as you agree with me. I told my wife and kids this, as I've said quite often, it looked at me like I pooed my pants. <laughs> like years ago when I first walked into Starbucks and asked for a cup of coffee, it's like, I had to ask my teenage daughter, how do you order a coffee? It's like, well, what do you want, Dad? It's like, I just want like a coffee and I want to put some cream and sugar in it. You know, it's like, okay, it was just tell them brood up, room for cream. You know, I was like, oh, okay, brood up, room for cream, brood up, room for cream. <laughs> anyway, I want a big one. What do I do? That's a vente, Dad. Okay. <laughs> anyway, my wife and kids looked at me like I was crazy. I did not know that I had such a problem with agreeableness. But this was an epiphany for me, and now to this day, every time I make a trade, I know that I expect the market to agree with me, and I know that it's going to cause some pain. So I got to make sure that I'm taking a trade that's a really good trade. And I thought I would get through this presentation without saying it, but I had need to make sure, as Dakota said, market wizards, that it's intuition and not into wishing two words into wishing when it comes to taking the trade. Now, the perverse thing is you're going to be wrong a lot even when you're right. One of you here, I think, Sharon, you sent this to me, and I thank you for that. There's an excellent presentation by Robert Frey on YouTube, and I forget which, was he with the Quantum Fund? He was with some big, huge mutual fund. I think he's since retired. But he said that you spend 70%, 75% of your time in a state of regret, in other words, drawdown. My buddy Greg Morris said, in investing with the trend, markets only make new highs 4% of the time. Now he's talking about the overall market, but that still makes a lot of sense. So this was a big winner from a while back, and I thought it'd be fun to see when it was making new closing highs, meaning that we're making more money in the position than we had, and then when it's backing and filling. I recently read a book about the Kelly formula. I forget the exact name of it, but it's in one of my now columns if you look at my website. I'd recommend you read it, but just be extremely careful with something like that. But I did like a quote that they said, which, which is true. With the Kelly formula, you're gonna spend a lot of time less wealthier than you were, or I forget how they said it, less wealthy. So with trend following, like the Kelly formula, they're going to spend a lot of time being less wealthy. So you can see most of this in here is red, but this did turn out to be a really, really great trade. But you can see that even though it went higher over the long term, most of the time was spent giving up those open profits. Now, without getting too much into the neurology just know that a negative emotion has twice the impact. And some of you here, one of you here, I should say, once sent me something that, that people think it might even be five times the amount. But I think the study I'm going off of was measuring dopamine or something in the brain. Anyway, before I dig myself into a hole on neurology and how little I know, just know that a negative emotion has a much more powerful impact on you than a positive one. So if you take the negative emotions with, let's just say, two times to keep the math easy, the impact, and then you multiply it times just kind of eyeballing this 90% of the time, so 9 out of 10 observations are going to be negative, it's going to be really hard not to micromanage. So that's where learning a little bit of neurology can really help you to wrap your head around all of this and why it's so painful to trade, and why it's so damn hard not to micromanage. Number 13, money and position management is crucial. As I often say, 
Money management will cure a multitude of sins. It's going to keep you in the game. It's going to keep you from betting your lifestyle. It's going to keep it from going to your head when you're doing well. And it's going to keep you from getting a little too depressed when things are not. As I often say, all trades eventually end badly. And as we just saw, a lot of the trade is going to be a negative observation. But as far as ended badly, you're either going to get stopped out or lost. Loss. You're either going to hit that initial profit target to get stopped out for a scratch, or you're going to hit the initial profit target, ride the trade out for a long, long time. And in the end, you're going to give up a shit ton of money that you once had. You're going to be less wealthy. Longer term, if you did catch that big old trend, you're going to be much more wealthier than you were, but over the short term, there's going to be a lot of pain. So money management is crucial, but more importantly than that, than money management, or as importantly, I should say, is a good offense. And if you're picking the best going in and leaving the rest, I know it's cliche, and you figure out if you did that through honest postmortems, through years of honest postmortems, I should say, then your offense is going to get better and better, and you're going to have less and less losing trades. Now, it's hard to quantify the non-trade, the trade you didn't take that lost money. But just remember that if you did take the trade that was mediocre and it lost money, from a drawdown perspective, if you lost 2% on that trade, it's going to take more than 2% gain to make back that loss. So it's going to put you behind the curve a little bit, and then that's going to create a bit of a mental problem because you're going to be working to make back that money. And you're going to have to be careful not to take some mediocre trade to try to make back what the market took from you. So it's a very dangerous downward spiral, you can get to it. Very hard to quantify the non-trade. And by the way, and this is something that I found out early on in my system development days, when I first had a few profitable systems, I'm like, all right, I finally got some profitable systems. Now I just got to figure out how to eliminate all the losers. Well, that's impossible. So if you could get rid of all the bad trades, and the only thing that's left is good trades, although that's impossible, you could work towards that goal by taking the best and leaving the rest. So a good offense is often your best defense. And again, not to beat the dead horse, which I would never do, trade the best and lead the rest. Now you're gonna need some experience. As I often say, it amazes me in the amount of people just jump right into trading. The barrier to entry is almost nil. You could fund a trading account with a few K, and you could be up and running really, really quick. Voila, you're a trader. You would never decide on a Friday night that on Monday you were going to be a doctor, even if laws would allow. Read a few books over the weekend, go buy some rags and exacto knives at Wally World, and start cutting on people on Monday. But in trading, metaphorically, people do exactly just that. Now, this one's hard. It's hard for me. It's hard for anyone. The market doesn't move on your time frame, as I've been saying quite a bit. Building a new house with an attached office, separate from the separate but attached, separate entrance. And I have a lot of financial pressures. We need to pay for this house in a few weeks. And then a bunch of little small, unpaid, unforeseen things that I never thought about, as I've been saying, a nauseam. $5,000 stove, $8,000 refrigerator. I mean, the world's going nuts. And I'm feeling pressure to pay for these things. But the market isn't obliging, at least not for all of them, and certainly not on my time frame. The other day, I was looking through my trading journal, and I must have done it close to bedtime or something because I woke up with an epiphany. Trading is so effing easy when I wait for the best setups, take them, and then follow my trading plan. I think I might write that down. <laughs> and it's true. 
if I just wait and wait and wait for a setup to where I have that F yeah feeling like I have to take it because it looks so damn good. And here's the thing, if it doesn't work and I had that F yeah feeling going in, I'm like, eh, I thought it would work. I'm surprised it didn't work. Eh, so what? I'm able to move on even with that loss. If I take a mediocre trade and it doesn't work, then I start to really beat myself up. Dave, why did you take that piece of crap? Why did you do that? So <laughs> I hope the voices in my head aren't bothering you guys. Now, here's another one that's tough, is that you must be present to win. Now, I often preach patience, patience, patience. Well, that is a secret to trading. If you can stay out of the market when conditions aren't favorable for your methodology, and then wait for that market to come to you, you're gonna do extremely well. The only problem is you must be present to win. I would love to take the summer off because summers usually are crappy. But once or twice in the middle of summer, sometimes you have a fantastic opportunity. In more recent times, volatility has come back to the market and the opening gap reversals, sort of the church of what's happening now, at least within my methodology, the way I trade, has been presenting some really good stuff. And if I was off sailing or whatever I'd like to go do, I wouldn't be there for it. The big winner I showed in a few slides back, I don't remember, I don't think we had a whole lot of big winners that year. And if I'd have been away from my screens the day that set up, I wouldn't have gotten it the next day. As I preach over and over again, this happened, I guess well, I was gonna say not too long ago, but boy, time flies. It, it was now probably a year or two ago. But I remember day after day after day, there's nothing to do, guys. Don't do anything. There's nothing to do. Next day, my trading service. There's nothing to do, do guys. Oh, but, you know, I wish somebody would have told me this 20 years ago. And I kept going on and on and on, day after day after day. Finally get an email from a client. Dave, I don't see anything to do in the foreseeable future. So I'm going to go away for a little while. And then what happens? That night, literally, I found two of the best setups for the entire year. As I've said before, another client, he didn't quit the service, but he quit trading. And just a few weeks later, we weren't doing that great, but just a few weeks later, I found setup after setup after setup. They hit the initial profit target, trailing a stop. All the things that I preach and beat the dead horse on were working out fantastic. So he just happened to take a peek at the portfolio, shoots me an email. He says, damn it, I feel like I broke up with my fiance and the next Saturday night she wins the lottery. So must be pleasant, must be present to win is a tough one. Now, I found this presentation, it's a couple years old and I freshened it up a little bit for today, but I thought it was kind of interesting that I had some old random thoughts in there. And one was if we get a death cross, which the market was on the, cusp of doing, and we'll take a look at it now, we'll see where we are. I pointed out it's not the magnitude of, it's it's not the signal in and of itself, just like the TFM system, which I'm gonna, we'll take a look at in just one second. It's the magnitude of what happens next. So if we get some sort of, sort of signal, like for instance, we already had daily bow tie signals, and then we had a few weeks back hourly bow tie signals, it's not the signal in and of itself traded mechanically, but it's the magnitude of what can happen after a signal. So if we get a signal of the TFM system, not every time, not all the time, but the market could drop 50%. Now it might just come right back, but in the meantime, a 50% drop would be a pretty big deal. So watch for the magnitude of what could possibly happen, or just know in your head the magnitude of what could possibly happen with any sell signal. It doesn't have to be a big Dave sell signal. And again, this is what I wrote a couple of years ago, shows you how much I beat the dead horse. Don't join the church of what's happening now. And remember, it's never different this time. There's always gonna be an excuse, like the market will come back and here's a reason, blah, blah, blah. So anytime the market gets, at, gets a little iffy, I quote Judge Dotery of Stadium Capital. 
Active management has underperformed since the lows of 2009, but this is to be expected. Anyone who has kept pace with the market the last few years should be questioned because they likely have not made any moves that would or will protect their portfolio from the next inevitable bear market or when the next inevitable bear market occurs, not if, when. And I need to correct this quote, I see. But anyway, Mr. Dotery's point is that getting out of the way, as I have done multiple times, as he has done multiple times, you won't look very smart when the market goes right back up. And the market's a bad teacher. We've had two horrible bear markets over the last 20 years, and people still preach buy and hold. And you can plainly see, go and look at the statistics in the TFM system, go back to last week in charts, which was August 22nd, 2019. It's on my website. If you can't find it on the website, it's on YouTube. YouTube.com slash C as in Charlie slash Dave Landry. But you'll see that in two of those sell signals, the market dropped. In one case, I think it was 50%. In another case, it was 44%, if memory serves. Thereabouts, close enough lost half of its value, which is a big deal if you're nearing retirement. And it's a, it's a, still a big deal if you're not nearing retirement and the market doesn't come back within the next 20 or 30 or 40 years. One thing Greg pointed out is that, as a side note, the buy and hold metrics are based on an 80-year time horizon. As Sweet Brown says, ain't nobody got time for that. So the question is, is winter still coming? Getting to the markets now. You guys want to start asking about individual stocks, go ahead. And I'll pop it to the charts, live charts in just one second. That bastard John Snow warned about winter forever. Bit of a henny penny. Well, the sky finally fell. My wife picked this up for me <laughs> a few weeks back. I need to see if she can find a receipt. She may have timed the market. <laughs> To the peak she says this and I, said, I said i'd rather you buy me a bull babe and she goes i know but i just thought it'd be cute to put outside of your office i'm like okay and i was gonna at some point i want to make an arrow put an arrow going the wrong way like the bear's kind of bummed out make it a little bit funnier but i thought now it's kind of funny and they're saying howdy and somebody pointed out with the indices making bow ties down it'd be cool to put a bow tie on them so i did so just really, really quick, I'm not going to spend much time on this because we have beat the dead horse to death. So let me just show you where we are with the TFM 10% system. Remember, this is a weekly, longer-term system, okay? So you want to pay attention to it. If you're trading the daily charts, then obviously you want to let yourself stop out on a daily chart. But if you're looking for a longer-term perspective, here's where we are. This blue line up here is simply how far the market is away from its 50-week closing high. So right here, you're making a new closing high down here. This would read zero because you're at that closing high. Right here, you're beginning to sell off right there. How far away from that 50-week closing high are you? Well, about 8% eyeballing it. Now, what I've observed is if you get more than 10% away from the 50-week closing high, you might want to think about getting out of the market, especially if the close is below the 50-week moving average as it was right here. So that would be a sell signal. But Dave, the market went up afterwards. Well, it's called the whipsaw. Look it up. <laughs> whipsaw is death and taxes. We're not gonna avoid them, okay? Unfortunately, that's how it works. As Greg Morris says, beating the dead horse as usual. <laughs> not Greg beating the horse, me. Whipsaw is a frustrating bear. Markets are devastating. So this could have been the start of something really ugly. We didn't know it at the time, we got out the way. But the market went higher. Well, what do we do? Well, we bought, okay? Or we began buying, at least on an individual issue basis. If you're following the system, you would have bought back in 2016 and had a pretty good run all the way until when? Right here, the sell signal here, which I think was on this day here. By the way, this green line 
is just 90% of this blue line, which is the 50 week closing high. So see how it just goes up, markets making new highs, new highs, new closing highs, I should say. So that's 90% of that. I'm almost done. You guys bear with me. I know you know the system. And then the sell is just when you have close below the 50 week moving average and you're more than 10% away from that 50 week closing high. So a sell would be illustrated by the red down here and a buy, you're just looking to stay long or get long as long as you're within 10% as you were for a long, long time of the 50 week closing high. And the initial buy, which first triggered way back here, is when you have at least two bars of Landry lights, light, meaning that the lows for at least two bars or greater than the 50 week moving average. So you can see right here, we had Landry light for a long, 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 long time. And then finally we begin to intersect the moving average. When you intersect the moving average or go more than 10% away from the 50 week closing high, the system goes to neutral. When you close below the moving average and you're more than 10% away or 10% or more away, I should say, from the closing high, it goes bearish. So for now, so far, I don't know if you can see this in your screen, there's a little smiley face down here. We're still in bullish mode, okay? So it's sort of like a red light, green light, yellow light. I wish there was a way to make this neutral yellow, which I think would be kind of cool. But for now, we're still bullish with this long, long-term system, okay? Doesn't mean you should rush out and buy stocks. But if you are doing some longer term market timing, like I know some of you guys are doing in the, in the Facebook group, then you can think about staying long until and unless this system begins to trigger a sell signal. Now, keep in mind, and I don't know if I have the slide in here because I didn't want to repeat too much of what I've said, but keep in mind that this is just one tool, okay? There are many tools, and we're getting ready to look at some of the shorter term signals in just one second. But it's one thing that just kind of helps to give you a good feel of things. Last week, I talked about last man standing, and I was talking about an IPO was long, and now I have a new stock that I'm long. But this IPO I bought on the five-day SMA Landry light system. I need to come up with a better name for this. And I was hoping, I know, hope, haha, good luck with that. But I was hoping this would turn into the mother of all examples of hanging on to a trend trade slash following the plan. By the way, the Facebook group, which is sort of morphing into what I envisioned as a mastermind group because we're helping each other out, throwing out some good ideas and helping each other kind of see the light, so to speak, has really began to turn into what I kind of envisioned as my mastermind group. And I'm just going to Let's see how things go. My initial plans, I don't know if I mentioned this to all of you personally, but my initial plans with the learning management system, sort of the learning management system 2.0, Dave Landry remembers 2.0, was to create a mastermind group where we help each other out and we all make a lot of money. That's the ultimate goal. And I didn't really have an official plan for that other than, okay, we're going to get everybody through all this training, maybe even. Uh, create some sort of what do you call those badges or something eventually this is 2.0 and once everybody's up to speed then we're going to start actually helping each other out and put this into practice well i'm about a year or two ahead of schedule so far from what the facebook group appears to be marking into so thanks to you guys and girls in the facebook group and that's been a heck of a lot of fun now this stock let me just get back to this real quick I don't have the chart updated, but if you were to plot it, you could see that I think I have another presentation where I show it. My stop was trailed to about right here, maybe a little bit lower, and then stopped out. I made a little bit of money, not enough to write home about on the second loaf, and I made the swing trade on the first loaf. It's better than the poke in the eye. I'm totally okay with that. I'm willing to move on and shout next. All right, keep the stock picks coming. We should have enough time to get to all of them today. I just have a couple more things I want to just zoom through real quick. So this is the new kid on the block. This is AUY. 
and it's a little gold stock triggered recently. This is the only stock I own right now in my portfolio. And I do have one little penny stock, a little penny gold stock. I kind of hate to mention it, but it's a penny gold stock. It's a very thick penny gold stock in Telechart. You should be able to find it. Pattern looks very similar to this one. And it hasn't made much money yet, but at least I think it's slightly above where we got in. We got in about the middle of this bar. I think 350 was the entry on that. So again, if you are a member of DaveLander.com, a gold member, join the Facebook group. And you can find that link on the top of the members page, www.davelandry.com slash members. And every time I say this, I get about 10 people who want to join. You have to be a gold member of davelandry.com. And that's to keep the riffraff out. As I say quite often, the great thing about the learning management system is somebody comes to me with a problem. Dave, I'm having trouble with my money management. Well, I, or even you, can look real quick and say, well, wait a minute, you really didn't do a whole lot of the money management just yet. Maybe you need to finish this course and then see how your money management is. And you're also not following the plan. Maybe you need to finish the mindset series. And you're having trouble pulling it all together, which is mine, methodology and money management. Maybe you need to finish the holistic trading. Anyway, there's a lot more detailed way of tracking it, but I've really, it's really been great because my ultimate goal would be to get everybody up to speed. And I've found that how I've approached that over the years has been very inefficient. As I said before, I had one surgery. I'm not sure if it worked or not. My right hand is bothering me too. So I could have three or four surgeries ahead of me from repetitive use. Now, some of that's my own fault by probably like this morning, I, I catch myself pushing down on my hand while I'm trading or I, I should, or more accurately watching the screen when I shouldn't be and things like that. But a lot of this repetitive use has come from me answering hundreds of thousands of emails. And a lot of the cases it's fallen on deaf ears. And so now I'm just going to move on when someone doesn't want to get it. I know it sounds like I'm being jerky, but if you want to learn, it's out there. And it's not my way or the highway, but I think I've got a lot of good stuff. Anyway, so join the members area and please become a member of the Facebook group. And let me get my short charts, my shorts. Chart shared analysis paralysis. Yeah, Donald was talking earlier when I was talking about some of these things. Is Yeah, find one simple thing and stick to it. And that's the that's the hard part for many. And, you know, as I've said quite often, Greg Morris has pointed out in some presentations where sometimes people have an indicator and then there's indicators that there are the exact opposite of the indicator. So one will be going up while the other's going down They're They're canceling each other out, but it's just the same formula inverted. I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but there was somebody years ago, and what he did was he created an indicator, and that indicator, intentionally or not, but that indicator is the exact opposite of another indicator out there. So if you got one indicator going straight up while another indicator is going straight down, it's actually sort of the same indicator. What is that telling you? It's not telling you anything. It's just creating analysis paralysis. Anyway, I know I digressed quite a bit. All right, the keep those stocks coming. The VAX. Okay, I like this stock quite a bit. It's been coming up in my scans. It does have a plethora of overhead supply. And I think we talked about this one recently. And this is why it's all drawn in. I guess that'd be a good problem to have. I like to position myself for the potential for unlimited gains. And I would be concerned that this stock would run into a little trouble around six bucks a share. And again, yes, that'd be a good problem to have. But as far as everything else, it's almost textbook in nature. It's, it's a beautiful bow tie. As you can see, it's a nice little first thrust. It's very persistent. So, I mean, this has got high five written all over it. 
with the main exception that it's going to have some problems getting through this overhead resistance, more than likely. Okay. Donald says the waiting can be the hardest part. Yeah, you and Tom Petty got it right. But it's so necessary. And as I preach, if I could wait and wait and wait and wait and wait, I almost certainly make money. But it's a big if in that sense. All right, Donald. That one's on the lander list today. Let's stay off of that one. But I agree with you. Starts with S. Ends in O. I know I'm being a little bit of a tease. <laughs> but yeah, that looks kind of interesting. Let's take a look at QTT. QTT does have a Phoenix characteristic to it. I think this is a Chinese stock. And I'm kind of hoping that with all this crap going on, these Chinese stocks just get beat up and just go sideways forever and then begin to rise from the ashes. So you might want to write that down. You don't want to bottom fish here, okay? And the China stocks. But if these things that have been beat up, these China stocks that have been beat up for a long time, begin to bottom out nicely and then begin to rally from the lows, like the Phoenix, begin to rise from the ashes, then I think they might be worthwhile. So this is kind of interesting. Maybe on a little bit more follow through and a little pullback. I mean, I guess technically the bow tie is already triggered, but I would definitely put that on my watch list and I would put some other Chinese stocks that are in the potential of making a Phoenix type of comeback. Now we're not bottom fishing, don't get me wrong, we're not bottom fishing. What we're doing is we're waiting for some sort of emerging trend pattern to develop, like a bow tie or a first thrust or something like that. And then hopefully there's not a whole lot of overhead resistance in these things. And that's why I was kind of saying in the ideal world, they'd bottom out for months and months and months and months and months and let all that overhead supply work its way through the system and also have that overhead supply so far away that who cares? So overhead supply, let's say 100% away, kind of like we have in this stock here. Yeah, who cares? If I make 100% on a stock, I'll be happy. If I made 100% on every stock, you'd never see my fat ass again. All right, any more questions? We're nearly out of time, but I think we got to all the stocks. Quite a bunch today. Well, cool. Well, as usual, I thank all you guys and girls for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Anything unanswered, go to davelander.com slash contact. If you are in the members area, if you are a gold member, then obviously submit it through the questions area, and I'll cover it in the members question and answer session. I think I'm going to take a couple of weeks off, by the way, FYI, because next week's Labor Day and the week after I have San Francisco. So I'm going to take some time off, get ready for, rest up a little bit, and then get ready for San Francisco. So everybody enjoy your rest of your summer, and I'll see you in early September. Thank you so much.